welcome back to the Valley to Peak Nutrition Podcast. I'm joined by Mark again this week. We'll, um, we're going to cover a topic that we'll talk about here in just a minute. Mark, how's it going? Good, man. I'm excited to uh, dive in with this. I, it's funny. So the topic kind of highlights too light, weight, et cetera. I, I've talked to you about from my perspective, but I haven't heard your story about. So I'm excited to hear your perspective. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's a good, that's a good preface to this because this all came about really from, it came, it came about, it culminated in me writing an article, which is, which sounds dramatic because it's not like it's this, <laughs> it's not like it's this published paper with a ton of information in it, but it ended up, I wrote an article because it kept popping up because it really three reasons. One, my own personal experience Two, it's a question that comes up all of the time um, in, in the program is people want to know like, what should I weigh? And they generally are aiming for something like what they weighed in high school. So you start having these conversations about, well, when is, when is light too light? But it really started a couple of years ago, whenever you and I were talking and you had made some personal observation and getting ready for hunting season that in the past you'd weighed you know, you, you had trained to put on muscle and you'd weighed above a weight that you felt like was maybe too heavy for what you were trying to accomplish. And then mm -hmm. you'd been on the flip side of that coin, which was you'd weighed a little bit, maybe too light, which you felt like, I don't want to steal your story, but didn't give you the chassis to, if you did fill a tag, talk a little bit about what your observations were from that. And then we can kind of jump into the article. Yeah. Yeah. I think you know, we've talked about both for you and I, we've each had a weight loss journey, uh, quite a long time ago for me, 10 plus years ago. And for a while it was like, okay, how I just need to lose weight. I know that. And I'm just going to keep losing weight until I don't know when, because I, I don't have this problem of being too light. So it wasn't something I thought of. Um, and at one point I got down into the one seventies and I'm six, two. And I was like, ah, I don't feel right. And uh, I think even my wife at the time was like, you're wasting away. Like the, you know, you're starting to not look healthy type thing. Um, and so that was the first time I wrestled with the concept and it wasn't, uh, super intentional. It wasn't super tied to performance. It was just like, okay, I'm on this weight loss journey. I don't know when it stops. And then I basically came to this realization of like, okay, this needs to stop. Like I'm light enough, if not too light. Um, so that's kind of how it started, but then yes, over the years, you know, over the 10 plus years, I've basically have been, uh, 98% of the time somewhere between somewhere in the one eighties. So somewhere between one eighty, somewhere to one ninety. Uh, and yes, there's been times I've tried to like be as strong as possible and put on some mass to come with that and get to one ninety. or at one point I had a goal of getting one ninety five. never happened. Uh, and then there's been times where I've been doing a lot more endurance stuff. And then I've been in the low one eighties, tying it to the context you mentioned of like hunting, hiking, things like that. I just noticed that for me, well, obviously endurance is a component to hiking, uh, and doing long efforts, whether that's a multi-day hunt or something like the death hikes that I've done. Yes. There's a point where you want to be light. But then I also, at the same time was like, okay, under a pack and then especially a heavy pack. And then especially on longer days, I just was starting to feel kind of weak. Um, and so I've just, you know, kind of settled on that mid one eighties where I feel like I have a good balance of endurance still can maintain some strength and ultimately just not only feel best in the mountains or like under a heavy pack or on a multi-day hike, like, yes, I feel the best there, but just the day to day, like it's just where I feel best. And so I've kind of, you know, number one, been way overweight in the past and then two dropped to figure out, okay, here's too light and then tried to put on strength and then realize my body doesn't really want to go up there. I mean, I could, I'm sure I could force it to get above 190, 195, but just really settled into a sweet spot where both day-to-day -day and performance, I felt best. And the other nice thing for me that's come with that is it's really pretty low maintenance to stay there, um, which is also a really nice thing because I'm not like counting calories or anything. So you, like you'd mentioned, whenever you started getting into the 170s, feeling like, eh, this doesn't really feel right. Was there anything in particular that made you feel like this might not be the, the end of the spectrum I want to be on either? 
uh the light end being too light yeah thing. yeah yeah for me and you really hit on it in your article uh my experience would just really uh be a plus one to everything you said but one energy um like even though theoretically like if you're lighter you can move faster etc yeah sure but i and i don't know if it was just the calorie deficit but i just didn't have the energy um that i wanted when i was that light the strength for sure as i mentioned um you know a word that i throw out this non-scientific but kind of a word that came to me during that experience was kind of durability like i just felt kind of weak kind of fragile um i just didn't feel as strong or as durable as i wanted to be uh and then another one and you highlighted this in article two was recovery of like okay i can go do these efforts and again maybe this was tied strictly to the calorie deficits that came with the lightweight but i just didn't feel like i was bouncing back well recovering well and then that then led into me to the top of that chain i mentioned not having the energy for the next day or for the next effort or for the next hike or for the next training session so it really became a cycle of like okay i'm not I don't, I don't feel fueled well or strong and then I'm not recovering well, which is, you know, a downward cycle from there. Yeah. And, and again, you know, part of like in the dynamic of when people reach out to the program, they, they obviously want to know, they want to know where they should weigh, like what's, what's the culminating piece where we should end up at. And, you know, they typically expect me to say some sort of a BMI chart and we'll talk about at the end of this, like what are there, there's really two things that I answer that by. And they're not on a chart. And I would, I'd really be interested to hear your perspective of what I think, as well as if you've got something that you use as a measuring stick to say, like, here'd be, a, here'd be a good thing to aim for. When you look at, um, when you look at nutrition, I think you can look at it on, if you, if you picture a triangle and you picture the end of those triangles being one of three things on one end of that triangle, you have weight-based goals. On one end of that triangle, you have performance on the trail. And then on another end of that triangle, you have like general health. If you have a particular thing in mind, a particular interest that exists on any end of that triangle. So like, let's say, just use you as an example, you wanted to be at 170, your shift would be towards that end that has weight. But that means that you are giving up the benefits or you are giving up the, the nutritional strategies that cause the other two ends of that triangle to be at optimum levels too, which goes back to your point of, yes, you know, people will say like, I want to be this weight. Is it possible to hit this weight? Is it possible to hit this body fat percentage? And I'll tell it, anything is possible. You, we can hit any weight and any body composition on the, that you want the question really is, do you want to suffer <laughs> to yeah. the degree of what you're saying that you want to be at? Because that's just the truth. You know, a lot of, a lot of what we see, and I'll just use online, even though I feel like it's, it's overplayed, it's, but it's something that we're all familiar with and use a lot. When we see an image online of a guy or a girl or whatever, who's aesthetically what we want to be, those people likely are not living there. And the sacrifices that they have to make to get there, they're not documenting about, but they're pretty painful, right? And, and one thing that you had mentioned just a second ago was just the, just the ability to be able to manage 170 is almost like a second job. And the ability to manage 180, 180 185, only 10 or 15 pounds heavy, we're not talking about at your highest weight, we're talking about in the middle of those two makes it far easier. And so when you think about that triangle, another thing that sort of made me want to write about this and to talk about it was there was someone um, local to here who I know and who I'm friends with, but had also been a client prior to us even being friends who they live in Boise. He sent me a text message one night and he said, I'm 15 pounds heavier than I've ever been when on a nutrition program. I haven't really been following any sort of nutrition. And I'm absolutely killing my running times why and my answer was very simple but 
it was true. I said, you're not dieting. You're giving yourself mm -hmm. the amount of nutrition you need. So now you're that pendulum on the triangle is shifting more towards performance. And so, yeah, your weight doesn't look like what you want it to weigh at. And you might even look in the mirror and feel like, ah, it'd be great to be a little bit leaner. But what you're getting in replace of that is better times in running, likely better agility, better performance, quote unquote, whatever that means to you in the mountains, et cetera. So if you're giving up one of those ends, it's very likely you're gaining another end, which is why it's so it's so important to think about and the hierarchy of what matters to you the most in your mind, you're eating towards that because you, you, you know, there's a lot of messages out there right now, but you really with it, with, with a couple of exceptions, you really can't have it all. You're either, you are either angling hard towards one weight or the other performance it's going to be really hard to find the perfect marriage of both it's possible and it's it's definitely possible not to be miserable while focusing on a weight-based goal but there might be some compromises in performance in that yeah yeah i'm right where that that guy you just talked about from boise is um not for me 15 pounds but uh as you know kyle like i started running more at the beginning of the year um that kind of put us on a bunch of conversations and my weight started tanking like pretty quick when I started running, which it had done prior. And so I knew like, okay, here's my quote unquote running weight when I'm doing decent mileage or volume, like at least the last time I did, here's what I weighed then. And the scale started dipping towards that, which is like low 180s, like 182 ish. Um, and I thought that's where I was going to be because that's where I was last time I did mileage like I'm doing now. Uh, and I just figured that's what's going to happen. I've actually bounced, like, even though it took that nosedive as I first started running, I've come back up to be in 186, 187, which is really a sweet spot for me. It's where I've been for a handful of years. And even though my mileage has increased in the last six weeks, my weight has stayed there, but I've been performing better than when I was running a bunch, call it four or five years ago, and was actually five, six, seven pounds lighter. Uh, Cause in Strava, which is pretty cool, like, but it'll see, you know, runs I'm doing now and on the exact same uh, course, exact same distance, whatever, it can show me runs from like 2014, 2015, 2016. I was like, oh, I'm actually fitter now, or at least having better times now, even though I'm six, seven pounds heavier. So I just echo what that guy said and what you said about performance is like, I'm not maybe as lean as I was then or anything else, but the performance is there. And that's, that's a good, the irony of, of that whole, this whole conversation is I would be willing to bet that most people, what they say they want aesthetically could be accomplished by prioritizing performance more than aesthetics but just, just managing a consistent intake, right? So on one end of the spectrum, you're not eating, you're not just eating like a maniac because you're exercising. The, the intake still is controlled, but it's not so much of a driver on, I want to see that scale move. Instead, it's a driver on performance. I, I gave a presentation last weekend in Pendleton. And one of the main points of that was when people start dragging and motivation for exercise, I usually encourage them to do two things. One, start focusing on training rather than burning calories. All of a sudden you enjoy it again. And then just to sign up for something, even if it's a local 5k, commit to doing something that you're training towards. And when you shift those two things, an interesting thing happens when you stop focusing, are you not necessarily focusing even, but when you stop caring so much about the results that show up on that scale, and all of a sudden you're more focused on fueling yourself for the endeavor, which is still generally controlled beyond what the average person does. All the aesthetic stuff you want just comes as a natural byproduct. And you're, you're, you're finding that you're pretty amazed at what your body is able to do because you're providing fuel for it rather than trying to remove fuel for the sake of hitting a number on a scale. Mm -hmm. Makes a ton of sense. So for me, I, you know, over however long of a period of time that I did, I lost basically half of myself. I was 270 at my highest, lost to 130. Aesthetically speaking, at 130, I 
looked like everything I would have told you I wanted to look like at 270, but couldn't, right? All whatever features people say they want, I had mission accomplished. I was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was a mess. I, I mean, and I was, I wasn't married at the time. I was in school. I was working, but I, I mean, I read the only thing I had to focus on was myself. So, you know, there was no one really close to me, um, having to suffer the ramifications of my hunger <laughs> <laughs> beyond, beyond myself and, and my, my parents. Cause I still lived at home when I was in college at that time. And so I, what I started to realize was this, and this plays into those, those four points in the article. Number one, one of the things that I lacked the most is I was tired all the time. It didn't matter what I was eating. It didn't matter the amount of caffeine that I took in. None of those things mattered. I was exhausted all the time to the point of where I'd drive home at night, I'd pull up in my driveway and I would just lay back in the car because I didn't have, I literally didn't have the energy to go inside. And it was about that time in combination with like noticing that I'm losing hair in the shower. Like I literally didn't have enough calories to regenerate the amount of hair that I needed. I thought, well, this isn't good either. (laughs) Right. And knew that I needed to change something. So at that point I had like, I was on, I had this, this spectrum to deal with number one. And I, I wasn't, a dietitian at that time, I still really wasn't even educated on nutrition, but I I had to deal with this fact of, okay, well, I can't go back to what I was doing because that took me way overboard, right? It was 270 pounds at five foot six. I can't go back to that. I can't keep doing this because frankly, like this isn't much of an exchange for a better life. And that's the reason I wanted to lose weight, right? To allow me to do stuff that I wanted to do. I couldn't do previous and to put me in a position for health that would give me quality and and quantity of life. So I started eating more with the intention of gaining weight, which is unfathomable to someone. And you, you would, I would imagine you would echo this too. It's unfathomable in your mind to tell yourself. It's very hard to tell yourself eat more after you just worked so hard to get off what was accomplished by eating less. Mm -hmm. But like, I knew I couldn't just sit there and live there. So I did, I started eating more with the intention of gaining about 10 to 15 pounds, which is uh, what ended up happening. So what it it, in just that little bit, that 10 to 15 pounds, because that was 130 was way too light for me. I immediately started getting better energy, right? So there was no more inability to walk inside. I stopped losing hair. I stopped dreaming about recipes at one point. Like I was so <laughs> low that I kept a shoebox full of recipes that I just would like dream about cooking one day. And that, that sort of leads into point four, which is you get your entire social life back to be at 130, you have to be so driven by the minutia of nutrition to stay there that you really sacrifice a lot on the front of the social department, right? So when someone comes and they say, I would really like to be at this body fat percentage, I would really like to be at this weight, which usually is a weight that they were at at high school. And they ask the question, can we get there? I'll tell them we can get there, but here are the things you're signing up for. And I will tell you, having had been there myself, that's not an exchange that you want to make. Now, most certainly you don't want to live where you currently are. You're telling me that. So there is somewhere in the middle that exists that we should aim for. But there is also a point where, you know, where some is good, more isn't necessarily better. Mm -hmm. Strength started getting much better strength, right? So the nature of nutrition is to grow a muscle, you have to provide energy that covers two things. One, your daily needs, right? There is a requisite amount of calories needed simply to make your heart beat, your liver work, your brain function for you to get up and go pee to activate those muscles. That is there whether you do any exercise or not. Then there's also an amount that's required for additional movement beyond that those have to be taken care of before your body gets the permission slip to say, okay, we've got enough there. We're not worried about it. We can take this little bit extra you're giving us and begin to 
improve strength, to begin to improve running times, to begin to allow you not to dream about food because we know that it's coming in. So immediately when I started increasing that calorie intake, putting on another 10 pounds or so, my strength, which is relative, don't be impressed by it. It certainly is nothing impressive, but for me, it was. And it was the thing that moved me beyond a plateau in terms of trying to increase or improve my strength. So, and maybe this is skipping ahead, Kyle, but I don't want to forget to ask the question. You're low, you're at 130, you're noticing poor energy, poor strength, you're knowing you're needing to put on weight. We have the benefit now of uh, retrospect saying that was 10 to 15 pounds. But then at that time, you started that process of, okay, I'm, I'm too light. I need to start adding calories. The scale is starting to move. I'm starting to put on some weight. And at the same time, I'm, I'm starting to feel better. I'm starting to get some energy. I'm starting to get some strength back, et cetera. How did you know when to stop? Or how did you find that sweet spot of like, okay, like this feels good. Like I'm, I'm at a high place. I just, I did not commit to a number, right? So basically I knew that I knew that I couldn't live at 130. Like I just, I just couldn't, I could, but the ramifications of that just weren't fathomable to me you know i i was not married at the time i wanted to get married i didn't have kids i wanted to have kids i didn't there was a lot of things that i hadn't done that i that i wanted that i hadn't done and i knew there was zero way for me to continue living the way that i was and have those things and to to have uh to have successful versions of those things sure you could be married and do the and and, and do the type of life that i was doing but I can promise you either your life, either either that 130 or my marriage was going to suffer and there was zero way I was going to find a wife worth marrying and let that suffer. So I just, I did not commit to a number. What I committed to was just adding in calories. So I simply added in 150 and I agreed to let myself just see where that went. And over a period of months that added on a hundred or 15 pounds, which I think there's two points to that. Number one, it took a while. Number two, 150 calories each day consistently eaten is not much. So Mm -hmm. if you, if you flip that on its head and sort of ironic, ironic, whenever we're talking about light being too light, but if you think that mocha that doesn't get logged doesn't play make a big difference in whether the needle of progress moves or not, it absolutely does. It doesn't take much on either end, either to increase weight for strength purposes or to reduce weight for or to decrease calories for um, losing weight. It doesn't take much to get that needle of progress moving. So what I committed to doing was adding in about 150 calories and just just seeing what happened. And what happened was over a period of months, all four of those things came back, and um, you know my weight ended up settling at about 145. And I just reevaluated and basically said, you know, like I can't imagine feeling better than I do right now. This is probably my cutoff. Now, if if I had gotten to 145 and I still felt terrible and I still had no energy, no strength, it was taking me a long time to recover between exercises. I was still sitting there constantly obsessing about food. All of these, if those things hadn't gotten better and my weight had stopped going up, I would have added in more, given it time and then observed again. It just so happened that my first trial at this what led got me out of what I wanted to be out of. Hmm. And I think that that, I mean, really anybody that's listening that would is thinking they might fit under this category, the same approach would be true. I wouldn't, I wouldn't target a number. I would add in a certain amount and just agree to see what happens. And then once you get to a point where your weight sort of settles, asking yourself, is this what I was looking for? Or do I think there's more? And if there's more, add in, give it time, observe, and then make changes again. What about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, over time, as I, as I kind of mentioned, I've had different goals or at least different, like, Hey, let's try this. Right. (laughs) Um, you know, I've, I've been 185, 186, 187, like for the most part, let me try and put on some strength and, you know, go 190 plus 195. And let me, 
go light uh, because of these specific goals. And so I've, you know, I've messed with a little bit lighter there, a little bit heavier there, but yeah, I mean, it, it really, I'm just in that sweet spot of really 180. It, honestly, it ends up almost always being 186, 187, where I feel the best in terms of strength, recovery, performance, ease of managing day-to-day life, um, just feeling best overall. But again, as you said, like it takes time to figure that stuff out. I mean, I'm talking, I have years of history here and will at the same time get like an itch to try something else, right? Like maybe I should be 182 or maybe I should be 192. But every time I try something, I end up either discovering it's possible, but it's not worth the effort or intention, or I just thought I don't feel as good. Right. And again, this is going to depend on the goals. If I wanted to compete in powerlifting, I would not weigh 187. Um, so it, it, it really is it, like going back to what you said, like that balance, that triangle of not trying to pull myself to one end, you know, not chase aesthetic aesthetics, not chase, uh, performance to a degree for you know a different goal but just have a well balanced i feel good every day i can go perform in the mountains i can go you know run a half marathon i can go do some lifting i can go whatever right it's just a sweet spot for me it is curious like you mentioned um early on i think in the intro like talking about bmi or like the metrics that maybe some people come to you with and i'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that because one thing i do find uh, interesting is for my height and weight, I am like borderline overweight, uh, according to BMI, <laughs> which I think is funny because uh, it'd be one thing, even if I were heavier and it was muscle, uh, I'm just flat out, not that big for my height. I don't feel like, like nobody's going to go, yeah, you're borderline overweight, buddy. Um, but you know, it, I just feel like it's a, again, from a non-scientific perspective, well, let the nutritionist correct me, but if guys or gals come into well, let me look at a BMI chart and see where I quote unquote should be. I feel like that's probably misleading. I just hate that stupid chart, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so, it's so irrelevant. And, um, I, I, let me say this. I think that w- when you look at that chart and for maybe for people who aren't familiar, a BMI chart's really just a, a measure against your height relative to your weight. And then it gives you a number that number then corresponds with standards on a chart and where you where your specific numbers falls on that table determines if you're either quote unquote underweight or underweight quote unquote normal weight overweight or obesity and then they split the obesity classes into three separate parts and I, you can look at that chart and you can determine really one I think it has value in one thing one are you so are you are you on such polarizing ends of the spectrum that we should be worried about your health meaning are you so far underweight that it's potentially posing a risk to you which i've seen are you so far overweight that it's posing a potential risk to your life and your health which i've also seen but then there's like the 99.9 percent of us who live in the middle where it just falls apart (laughs) and and part of that is because exactly what you're saying you could have a perfectly healthy guy who doesn't fit within the the who borderlines on the overweight category since simply because he carries more muscle mass but you'll have physicians telling him it would be good for you to lose some weight because of your bmi being this which is mind-blowingly ignorant in my <laughs> to me i think it, yeah i don't even feel like i carry that much muscle mass and i'm still like for my height normal yeah. weight is so th- those numbers that you mentioned the rating is like so normal weight is 18.5 to 24.9 for everybody. With my height and weight, I'm literally 24. And so I'm like the upper, upper spectrum. Overweight begins at 25. And again, I don't even feel like I have that much muscle mass. So I can't imagine like being my height with 10 pounds more muscle, which really still wouldn't be that big um, if you were to look at somebody, but definitely falling in the overweight class. And then like even normal weights in that range goes down to like, I could be 40 pounds lighter Mm -hmm. than I am right now, 40 pounds and still be in quote unquote, the normal weight range, which to me, I'm like, I don't, I'd be back where you were like, I'm going to have to like 
take a nap to get up and go pee if I weighed that much. Like it, I can't imagine functioning. And you're, that's the perfect scenario as to why it bothers me. Because if you, let's say that you were on, let's say that you were above 24.9, which now puts you in the overweight category. We are providers, health providers are instructed. You should have someone be within a normal BMI range. So they'll encourage patients to lose X number of pounds to get into that BMI range. But he, and here's my problem with it. When you look at data, there is nothing that says that person is now healthier. You've just accomplished a weight. That's it. It doesn't yield you anything, any advantage by being there. Meaning if, if you, if you were to, if you were to be told that you need to lose 10 pounds and at the end of that, it improved your cholesterol, it improved your risk of heart disease, it reduced your risk of diabetes, it did all of these things just by losing 10 pounds and falling in this green zone. Maybe we could argue that the juice was worth the squeeze and it's worth talking about, but it's not. There comes a point where once you get to a range, and this is going to vary for everyone, once you get to a range, most, and you're making certain decisions every day in terms of your nutrition, your health, your exercise, et cetera, you don't, you don't improve anymore just by losing a number, right? So like for me, I didn't, I, I was no more healthy at 130 than I am at 145. And this is the second problem I have with it. When you're dealing with people, even if what they, even if, even if a chart says, here's where you should be, that doesn't take into account the potential issues that come up to getting there, right? People don't struggle with their weight because they're bad at math. So, you know, being at a surplus and being at a deficit, it's life, social situations, delicious food at our fingertips. The fact that we have crazy schedules and don't want to meal prep, the fact, all of these other things are what drives the weight to be hard to stick to. And, and this still carries into the BMI conversation. When you tell someone, Hey, if you just lose 10% of what you currently weigh, which for a 300 pound guy would be 30 pounds, your health by way of even lab markers will likely improve. That guy is going to feel far more like, you know what, I could make some changes and get to that. He's going to be far more motivated to doing something versus, ah, you've got about 150 to lose before you get in that green zone. He's not even going to go try because the the, um, the amount of yeah the amount of distance between where he's at and where he is told he needs to be to accomplish this thing is is so unfathomably impossible why even try and frankly I don't I don't blame him that would be hard I didn't wake up whenever I lost 140 pounds I didn't wake up thinking you know my first day was not like I'm gonna lose 140. It was literally like, I don't know, I just need to change something and started making steps that culminated in that much. But that's often what, I mean, I can't tell you the number of people, especially um, folks who are older and went to go get evaluations for joint and hip replacement. They are told because it does show whenever a person is at a lower weight, they improve their, their, their outcomes in terms of surgical risk. That's true. But most, most people tell them you need to be in this green zone or you need to be in this zone but that ends up resulting in them thinking they need to lose 60 70 80 90 100 plus pounds and they just can't even like fathom to begin how that is going to happen and so anyway that's why i struggle with with the with the bmi thing what i tell people when they ask this is i say really there's two things one we need to find the weight that allows you to do the things that you love at the rate and the pace that you love to do them without risking injury to yourself. That's number one. Number two, the weight that does not cause or perpetuate any type of chronic disease or health risk. So you could be able to hike until you're blue in the face, but if your heart disease risk is through the roof, <laughs> then we can't really say that's a good weight for you to need to be at. We should, we should probably change that mm -hmm. on the flip side of that. If you've got no risk of heart disease, no risk of diabetes, none of these things, but you can never go with your friends in September to hunt elk because you just feel like I, I could never keep up. My weight is the greatest barrier to that. Well, you know, that may not be posing a risk to your health, but it's posing a risk to the quality of your life. We could argue that that's not a good weight for you to be at. However, if you find that if a guy's at 250 
and he gets to 215. Are and both of those things are there. Does he get anything extra by going to 205? Probably not. Probably not. Not if both of those things are taken care of. And you know, that was one of the things that drove me to want to write this too is it's like yes, and most everyone that I meet probably would benefit from losing some weight. But do you need to lose down to 185 like you were in high school? Probably not. And I will tell you that stretch between 205 and 185, that last 20 will probably put you in a pretty miserable spot whenever 205 gives you the things that you want from a physical standpoint and a health standpoint. Like, why can't we just be glad that you just literally drop 45 pounds and can do anything you want now? That's that's pretty exciting, even if you don't get to 185. Yeah. Or like something that comes to mind with me of that too is like someone has lost some weight, they made progress, health markers are better, they're feeling better. And it's like, okay, yeah, like maybe you want to get from 205 to 185, maybe. But treat that as a long-term goal, meaning don't continue to make like crazy sacrifices to achieve something that may or may not be worth it, right? So let's gradually decrease, you know, calorie intake and see what the scale does and et cetera, and, but still make it manageable, right? Because you're in a much better place than you were. Like you don't have to go drastic at this point to make a change. You're healthier. So it's like, you know, but over time, maybe you do get to 185, maybe you get to 195, maybe you just, you know, be more content and maybe with some small changes and just start to live life and enjoy things a little bit more. Cause again, you've already made great progress. And it's like, just back to what you're saying, like the, the number on the scale at a certain point just isn't worth. Cause again, the number's not the goal. The quality of life is the goal. So there's, you know, there's a decreasing benefit to chasing a number when you're sacrificing quality of life after you've already drastically improved your quality of life. Yeah. I mean, and we're guilty. We're being me guilty of like monitoring progress every week and looking at metrics and blah, blah, blah. But then someone just has a really crappy week, like a family member dies or what any, any host of problems that can come up and they, you know, they'll, they'll end that week with a net zero of no, no changes, right? No weight loss, no weight gain, no inches, blah, blah, blah. And they'll be very disappointed in their check-in. And I've learned over the years, both through my own experience and just working with other people, like with the week that you just came out of, to not have reverted to old habits and gained 20 pounds or five pounds over that week and to come out with a net zero is as worth celebrating as losing five pounds. And to your point, you're right, picturing this thing as a long-term as a long-term sustainable rate of loss, if you do want to get to 185, I think even being fluid, like rather than commit being bent on 185 and doing everything in your power to get there, because something you, you've got to keep in mind is whatever you do to get to this number, you will have to keep doing to stay there. If you stop any of those things, the weight's going to come back up. So how you get there, it's important to evaluate, is this something I can keep doing? Because one thing I'd learned in, in my own journey was I knew there was 0% chance that I could keep doing forever what I was doing to stay at 130, nor did I want to. So I had to strike a balance between, okay, I, I would rather have my weight come back up be able to be at a manageable um, pace in terms of what I do for nutrition and exercise to be there. And I mean, when I was 130, I had all of these nagging injuries, right? I mean, I couldn't do anything that wouldn't result in some sort of little nagging thing that never fixed itself. And when I intentionally gained that 15 pounds, like that went away. My performance got way better. My energy went through the roof and I was all of a sudden able to be social again, like go participate in, in stuff without having to feel like, okay, I'll, I'll come, but I'll wait till the dinner's over. So that way I'm not forced in a position where I've got to eat that because I don't know what's in it. And that'll affect my calorie intake and that'll affect my weight. And I want to stay at 130 because it just works. It's just a, 
it's just a mindless game of circles that's not worth playing in my opinion and so now Mm -hmm. like you know we're um going on that that hike in june and my pendulum shift has definitely moved more towards that triangle of performance and it's fun right i mean it doesn't and i think it's important to remember like it doesn't have to be one or the other i'm not because i'm i'm training so much i'm not giving myself permission to eat like a complete idiot but i am prioritizing energy on my hikes recovery from those hikes i'm prioritizing those things more than a scale meaning if i feel hunger i'm not pushing that that sensation off i'm i'm eating because it's my body telling me you either need energy or you need some recovery fuel whereas if i'm more focused on weight I might postpone eating, right? Like I might not eat until the following morning whenever my breakfast is. So I think that there's value in knowing what your main purpose is and then that letting be the driver of what you do. Yeah, that's a great point. Four simple things to process and decide at what point light might be too light for you or maybe you took other things away from the episode. If you got any questions about something you heard on today's podcast or previous episodes, give us a shout at info at v2pnutrition.com. You can also head over to the website, v2pnutrition.com. There are loads and loads and loads of free resources and articles and just other podcasts and just a host of different things that are all aimed at helping people perform and prepare optimally in the mountains as well as just really any journey when it comes to nutrition um, and and doing the things that they love to do. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or leaving a review. Both of those things help us out in a tremendous way and we would be very grateful for either of them. Be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, have a great week, everyone.